Hi, this is 2020 Church, and I'm Pastor Larry Enriquez. You know, every once in a while, I'm in the mood to watch just one of those Hallmark kind of movies where there isn't like a lot of conflict. I, I kind of want to just rest and see something that doesn't take too much work for my brain to to uh, enact. And, and maybe I'm just sleepy and I just, or it's been a tough day, I, I want to feel good. Uh, that kind of thing, but but I realize that those movies are are never very good. <laughs> and what, and halfway through, I'm going, why am I watching this senseless movie for? And I'm not saying that every Hallmark movie is bad or anything like that, but but I realize that with with every good thing, the good thing is a good thing because it's juxtaposed to some kind of bad thing. It's almost like you know the reality of life is that there's always something good but it's juxtaposed to something that's difficult, challenging, bad, or evil. That's how life is. It's the color of life. I say this because in 1 John, we have wonderful themes, the theme of joy. that It tells us right at the beginning up front, and if you do as I say in this letter, then you too will be full of joy as they are, as John and the disciples are. They want them to enter into the fellowship, the koinonia of, of, of the Godhead, and in that they're going to experience joy. They're going to give them an eyewitness account that if they believe what they're saying and embrace this Jesus, they'll experience the same fullness of joy that they have. And they want them to enter into this joy. But this book, as much as it's about joy and love, and, and fellowship, that it's, that it's surrounded by warnings and the reality of an evil one that exists. It's true to life. This reality of, again, the goodness of life is juxtaposed to the evil of it. It's the way life is. So we can read in 1 John chapter 2, My little children, I am telling you this, so that you will stay away from sin. In other words, evil has its place to lure us, to tempt us, to move us away from the joy, to move us away from love, to move us away from fellowship. So First John is this wonderful gospel that includes these wonderful themes, but yet having to work through the fact that evil exists, the Antichrist exists, sin is real, and we have to now work out the fact that the tempter is here to move us away from the goodness that God has for us. So, here we are going to enter into 1 John chapter 4. Reviewing what's been said, John makes it clear. I want to remind you that John is an older man now. Uh, he's the same writer of the what we would call the fourth gospel account, the gospel of John, or according to John, and also the writer of, of the book of Revelation. It's that writer. He's an older man as he's writing, and he sees the practicality of life. He sees the freedom that comes in Jesus, but how also, how also false teaching and the evil one through that can take away people's joy and people's freedom. And like joy and freedom come hand in hand. When you're free in Christ, that is free from the things that entrapped us and, and took us away from him and that fellowship that's unique to us uh, and, and God and each other, that, that we can become enslaved to old sins. And if we have never really found freedom to live for God, then maybe we've never ever really left our old life. So John says these things, and then in verse 18 of chapter 2, says, Dear children, this world's last hour has come. You have heard about the Antichrist who is coming, the one who is against Christ, and already many such persons have appeared. This makes us all the more certain that the end of the world is near. So John expresses the reality of the Antichrist and that being known in personalities that will, that will receive or host the evil one and do its bidding to destroy humanity and to destroy you and your families and me and mine and nations. 
but that we're warned. And that's why John is writing these things that we wouldn't be caught up in the things that would again, render us ineffective. See, once you belong to Jesus, you'll never not belong to him, but the evil one can render us ineffective. So let's not let that happen. So John gives a warning in the midst of these beautiful themes. He also mentions the fact that that the evil one is a liar and, and that when we say certain things, it'll prove that we are either liars also or we're genuine believers. And that's shown by what's, what's, what's really seen in life. In other words, real love, real fellowship with God will reveal itself in the way that we act. John will say, if you see a brother in need and you don't help him, what does that say about what's happening inside of you? Uh, he, he, he tells us that, that if we're really Christians, then we'll love each other. You know, think about it just for a second. There are people in your life, especially those who love Jesus, who you may be at odds with. Or your personalities are just a little bit different, and, and you've got to work that out. Christians work that out. They don't let personality differences take love away from them. How do you love another? John will also speak about this, this idea of love being agape love, God's kind of love for you and God's kind of love for me. And that kind of love demands a laying down of our lives. The same word for laying down our lives for one another is the same word that Jesus used in the Greek to lay down his garment, what he did in action. He laid aside his garment. He laid it down. We lay down our lives that way. We lay down our lives. We sacrifice our lives for the sake of others. But in that, you find real joy and real purpose and real fulfillment. Goes on. These remarks of mine about the Antichrist are pointed at those who would dearly love to blindfold you and lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you in your heart so that you don't need anyone to teach you what is right. For he teaches you all things and he is the truth and he is no liar. And so just as he has said, you must live in Christ never to depart from him. That's the life of the believer when we belong to Jesus. But your life will reveal that. Now, there are days, times, seasons where we don't seem to act much like the way we're supposed to. But we're struggling. We know it. We're in pain. We're, and that doesn't justify bad behavior, but the reality is that we're aware, oh, I got to get back on track. That is living for Jesus in a way where I'm loving people. Because that's what happens. Real love in the Bible is real expression in the practical life. Now let's take a little bit of a, if I can, a little bit of a turn in our thoughts here. John is writing this book in light of those who are trying to poison these congregations with false teachings about Jesus. It's, that, it's the Antichrist idea or person that's involved with false teachers. He goes on to say, just because somebody say, says that they're from God doesn't mean that they are. And anybody who denies that Jesus really came in the flesh to do what he did for us on our behalf is a liar. So he's making it clear that there were those back then who were talking about Jesus in a way to say that, oh, Jesus being God would really never take on flesh. He just took flesh as a host. He really was the spirit man. And before he died, he left that body. Things like that. Things that justify bad behavior. In other words, because my body doesn't really count. This is kind of part of the teaching of the Gnostics, but there are many branches of, the, of Gnosticism. But an idea is because the body really doesn't matter. It just hosts me as the spirit. What really matters is my spirit. What I do my, with my body doesn't really matter. So it justifies me doing evil or lustful things with my body. It doesn't really matter. Anyway, these are false teachers, false teachings. John says, stay away from these people. Just because they say they're from God doesn't mean that they are. Test the spirit. Is this Christ-like or is it not Christ-like? It's important for us 
to understand. Now, we come now to 1 John chapter 4. That was a little bit of a review, but I wanted to say those things. <laughs> but here's a little bit of a, re a review of, um, of not just the review, but now getting to, to chapter 4 of, of this epistle, this letter. Dearly loved friends, don't always believe everything you hear just because someone says it is a message from God. Let's just stop here real quick because dearly loved friends, a, a better translation is, and it's, it's kind of old fashioned. We might hear those old fashioned preachers if you ever get to listen to them. Uh, J. Vernon McGee, I, I like listening to him on occasion, and, but he, was, he would always say, dearly beloved, beloved. There's only one word in the Greek, it's dearly loved friends. There's three words here, but the actual Greek, there's just one word that means, that really means the loved, uh, the, the loved ones. So beloved is a good way of expressing that, that I'm speaking to you, somebody who I love. And that's how, that's how John is expressing or addressing his listeners, dearly loved friends, beloved don't always believe everything you hear. They're gullible. But not only that, you don't have to be gullible. The enemy that, that serves to, to bring us to demise is smart. He's smart and he's a deceiver. And with every deception, there's enough truth to kind of lure us in, to kind of beg us in. But enough falsity or lies to keep us disconnected from the Lord and from each other. Don't always believe everything you hear just because someone says it is a message from God. Test it first to see if it really is. For there are many false teachers around and the way to find out if their message is from the Holy Spirit is to ask, does it really agree that Jesus Christ, God's Son, actually became man with a human body. If so, then the message is from God. So, of course, there's much more to what's a good message or not, not a good one or true or a lie, but he's speaking in the light of these false teachers that were Gnostics to this specific truth and this specific lie that Jesus was not in the flesh, he was just in the spirit. It moves us to the first part, the very first chapter of First John here, where he says, we are eyewitnesses to this Jesus who came in the flesh. He wants to make sure that we understand that objectively, not subjectively, not my, what I feel or think about Jesus, but that Jesus really came in the flesh. And that's vital to our understanding of the coming of the Son or the incarnation that God became flesh. Important for us to hold that truth, to not let any false doctrine or teachers come and take you away from that truth. Does it really agree that Jesus Christ, God's Son, actually became man with a human body? If so, then the message is from God. If not, the message is not from God, but from one who is against Christ, like the Antichrist. It's again making this connection to false teachings being connected to Antichrist. That Antichrist is going to, in the last days, bring false teachers to take people away from Jesus. This morning I was driving with my family down a beautiful area here where, where I live. And, and, and in the middle of this beautiful walking path are a couple, I'm sure, lovely ladies sitting there with with uh, with chairs under the shade as they people are walking up uh, uh, between the pepper trees and, and they're there with a big sign to give the message of the Jehovah Witness. I'm sure they're lovely ladies, but they have an ugly, ugly truth. They are false witnesses of Christ. They are not telling the truth. Their doctrine is a lie. Their, doctor, their doctrine comes from the Antichrist. They have many things that they teach that are not biblical 
My point is that in the end times, there'll be many false Christs. They'll come out looking very pious, very God, godly, very biblical. Of course, it's only their Bible, the Watchtower Bible. There's a lot of things to say about that, but I'm here, not here to refute Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm here to just tell you that in the end days, the Antichrist will have many false witnesses, many false teachers, and they're going to come and speak what the Bible does not say. They're going to somehow want to entrap you to thinking you have to do something to make yourself right with God. And First John tells us that is the it's the we're only atoned by what Jesus did for us, that he bought us back, that he bled and died for us. And we were called to receive him. Not work for it, but to receive it. And this this receiving of this love is called grace love, agape love. We're not called to give out and give away that agape love with others. That's how we know that we belong to Jesus, because we love like Jesus loved to be practical with it. He goes on to say, Dear young friends, you belong to God and have already won your fight with those who are against Christ because there is someone in your hearts who is stronger than any evil teacher this wicked world, uh, in this w wicked world. I, I've always memorized this this way. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That translation is a very good translation as to the reality of the power of a believer not to live in fear but in strength against the evil one because Jesus Christ, the Godhead, in the person of the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And we can live in the confidence of God's presence inside the heart and the soul of a believer. Hopefully that's you. That's me. Dear young friends, you belong to God and have already won your fight with those who are against Christ because there is someone in your hearts who is stronger than any evil teacher in this wicked world. These men belong to this world, so quite naturally, they are concerned about worldly affairs. The world pays attention to them. But we are children of God. That is why only those who have walked and talked with God will listen to us. Others won't. That is another way to know whether a message is really from God. If it is, the world won't listen to it. Isn't that so? You know, we're in a very messy period of, in a very messy period of time in history in our country where we're very divided. Primarily, we would call the liberals and the conservatives, but but we're more divided by the very world views that are being exposed. We as Christians hold to the world view that the Bible is the lens by which we we interpret the world we live in and how we're to navigate it. The world view that we hold as Christians is that God is and that God is moral and God is right and God is loving and God is good, but also that God is just. And so our worldview is that there are those things that are good. They reflect God and who he is. There are those things that are evil. They are the opposite of who God is. And we have a morality in the justice system that, that hinges on the reality of the biblical Christ, the biblical God that we hold to. So we have a number of people in this country who hold to that worldview that God is who he is. And the great institutions of this country are built upon the fact that this God exists and that he is, that he's given us order and he's given us freedom and love. He's given us laws that we can live by and have wonderful communities. Then we have a whole other worldview system that says there is no God and really what matters is what we believe matters and it's our appetites, it, it's, our, it's our desires, it's our need to be our own authentic selves and nobody should get in our way, do what we want to with our bodies, do what we want to with our minds, do what we want to with our sex organs, whatever it is. And the divide is between those who hold a biblical worldview and those who don't. The Bible says the Antichrist is here. And we'll find it in many false teachers. 
And many of those worldly views will come into the church, the so-called church. And there'll be false teachers within buildings that claim to be church buildings. But they will wave the very evil homosexual flags. They will wave the very ugly banners that say, we believe that to be fully human is to be fully engaged with my own natural self without any sense to the reality that we are all born naturally sinners and need Jesus to come and forgive us our sins and then give us, given us an internal governor in conscience through the Holy Spirit to say no to the natural selves that want to be sinful selves. Whatever that is, whatever that sin is, whatever it is that, whatever that bent is that is hurtful to my God and to, and to people that I, I'm called to love. Dear friends, let us practice loving each other, for love comes from God, and those who are loving and kind show that they are the children of God and that they are getting to know Him better. But if a person isn't loving and kind, it shows that he doesn't know God, for God is love. It's a great statement about the character of God. God is love. He doesn't just love. He's not just loving. He is love. He is the definition of love. Important to hold and embrace that reality. We have a new group that's starting in a, in a sister county. And it's this, this, again, homosexual group. And I really don't mind addressing this reality because it really is a satanic movement has been going on for, I saw it years and years ago, this movement, an agenda, not just individuals who seek to, to be uh, homosexual, but a whole agenda to move everything towards that acceptance and embracing of homosexuality. And so this new group that is formed here and has now uh, a, a, you know, a building and a sign that says love is love. Well, it's not true. Love isn't love as they define it. And in fact, they're not saying love is love. They're saying love means I can have sex with whomever I want to. We can extrapolate that and go further. If love is about having sex, then, and that's really what all that is about, then who's to stop me from having sex with whatever I want to? Well, God can stop us because God says, no, that's wrong. We follow God. I'm not better than those people. But I'm in love with God and want to do what's right by Him. Learn to please God, not the world we live in. The world will not receive our message, John says. They won't like it. We're not called to shove it down their throats. We're just called to accept the fact that they won't like your message or your belief system. Don't whine about it. Just go, how can I love them even though they don't like the fact that I have a biblical world view? And it's, instead of fighting this, this one issue over another issue, it's just better to really address the real issue. We have different world views, different ways of measuring morality, what's right, what's wrong, where we've come from and where we're going. Let's talk about those things if they allow it. If not then accept the fact that they will not believe what we say is a biblical message. Well, let's close with this idea. John is weaving through this wonderful theme book of love and joy and light and fellowship, the reality that there is an antichrist who has false teachings that we have to fend against and be alive to and not let infiltrate the church or let infiltrate your personal lives. And your life, your real life in Christ will be manifested in the way that you love others and the way that you love brothers and sisters. May Christ be seen in you, that your love would be biblical love, that it would be agape love, charitable love. And in the right place that you have eros love with your husband or with your wife, 
and that you have that you have friendship love with the phileo love with, with those who are friends that you have familial love with those who are your relatives, but that we have agape love for everyone. And that love generates with God and is given to us. May we love like Jesus loves in a world that won't receive our message. May we be love, may we be light, may we reflect Christ in this very difficult end time age that we're in may god protect you watch over you strengthen you give you all that you need to do and say as you live out this life with confidence in him for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world well i hope you take this message well and i hope that it encourages you and strengthens you strengthens you to live the christian life god bless you i hope to see you this sunday at church then next week We'll be at church camp in San Clemente. Come visit, come visit us there. Well, love you. Go in peace. We'll talk to you soon.